Hello, good people. Um, uh, I know you're probably, some have maybe finished their entree or in the midst of it, or maybe we'll go back for a, a little bit, but because of time, I think this is a nice juncture uh, to transition to our uh, keynote speaker, uh, Professor Michael Hanchard of uh, the University of Pennsylvania. And so I just want to say a little bit about Professor Hanchard and then, um, and then turn it over to him. Uh, Michael Hanchard is a uh, professor in the African, professor and chair in the Africana Studies Department at the University of Pennsylvania uh, and director of the Marginalized Populations Project. Uh, he, his interests uh, combine a specialization in comparative politics with an interest in contemporary political theory, uh, themes of nationalism, xenophobia, racism, and citizenship. Uh, he is the author, author of several uh, books, uh, notably Orpheus in Power, um, uh, Party Politics, Horizons in Black Political Thought, and most recently, which is, uh, was recently published uh, by Princeton University Press, The Specter of Race, How Discrimination Haunts uh, Western Democracy. Uh, and so uh, I just wanted to say that initially, uh, even though I did my graduate training in Chicago, and around that time, Professor Henshad was uh, then at Northwestern University, we didn't really formally um, meet uh, until um, a few years later, when I was initially a visiting faculty member and then a postdoctoral fellow at Johns Hopkins University, uh, initially uh, their kind of first postdoc, 50% in, in what was then uh, uh, a new center for Africana studies and 50% in political science. Uh, and after my first year, uh, Professor Hanchard uh, ended up uh, joining the faculty as, uh, as an endowed chair uh, in political science, but also with uh, uh, an affiliation within, within Africana. And we just realized, I think you would agree at that point, um, we had a lot in common. But I remember there was this one day and something happened, I'm not gonna say all the details, <laughs> and he says, Neil, I'm not your regular academic. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. You know, the response was not necessarily someone I expected who had this big endowed, you know, chair. And he says, I'm not your regular um, academic. And I says, we're going to be friends. Um, and, uh, and so we've really kept in contact when I was fortunate uh, to, when I was a, a, uh, on my assistant professor leave and had a Woodrow Wilson fellowship, the terms of them were to have one scholar in the field who you would work with for the year while you were on sabbatical. And so uh, immediately, uh, without question, uh, I asked uh, uh, Michael Hanchard if he would be it. And it's not just a professor like you check in by email. It was one of those where there was, there was a conference, at Princeton, is that what? There was a conference? Uh, what, the yeah, the Mellon and, and Woodrow Wilson, where you had to be there for several days. So these are people who had to commit um, beyond just simply sending uh, e uh, comments. Um, and so I've just really appreciated uh, his work, but more importantly to our conference theme, and I think his latest book, but really his life's um, work, has really, really speaks to not only we think, how do we think about democracy and freedom both uh, in a U.S. context, but really transnationally, uh, and, uh, and, and I couldn't think of a, a better person to be able to offer some uh, remarks, and so uh, we had agreed then, you know, it's, since it's been a long day, but still, this is uh, this is going to be uh, you know exciting for us all. Thir uh, Thirty minutes, I think, is what we, you know, más o menos. Um, and uh, and we said if people are tired, then we'll you know round of applause and close it out. But uh, I suspect there also be questions. So you know, probably ten to, uh, five to ten minutes of questions should should folks still be on their uh, on their feet. So just join me in welcoming uh, Michael uh, Michael Hancher. Okay, so good evening. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, Carrie uh, Green and Veronica Bosley for their logistical help in helping me and all of us get here. Also, for uh, Neil Roberts' uh, friendship and intellectual camaraderie over the years. Um, it's one of those examples, yet again, that someone whom one mentors ends up mentoring you in some ways, and I've learned a lot from him over the years, and I'm very appreciative of it. Um, this evening, when he told me that I was going to be speaking at this time, I wasn't sure whether he was trying to, uh, he was using me to help keep you awake, or if I was going to induce narcoleptic seizures. <laughs> but I figured, I tried as I might, I would hopefully at least uh, interest you in what I have to say. This is for my most recent book, um, I'm going to generate some uh, conversation. So what I want to start with is um, a clip from a film, a documentary called The Best of Enemies. This is from a series of debates uh, between Gore Vidal and William F. Buckley 
over the 1968 presidential elections, and I think there's an exchange here. Uh, it was, it got this this interaction got increasingly bitter over the course of the uh, the shows, but I think it, it in some sense capitulates what I'm trying to get at in this in this talk. How many percent have 5% of the income? I think this is it. It seems to me, I know that you would you revel in no, that I, kind of in the politics. I think it's only because it's based upon You see, I believe that freedom breathes on any quality. Uh, and that's say that again. Uh, uh, freedom breathes any quality. Now, I'll say that a third uh, time. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually now, I'm making my joke Unless you have freedom to be unequal, there is no such thing as freedom. And we fuck with so, as I mentioned, the above clip was taken from the documentary Best of Enemies, which focused on the series of debates between Gore Vidal and William F. Buckley during the 1968 presidential election campaign. Buckley, often referred to as the father of the contemporary conservative movement, held a number of views that are now considered u uber conservative, or even then, in the words of Gore Vidal, crypto fascist. And yet, Buckley's assertion, shot at three times in this particular exchange, is actually pedigreed in a form of politics that, for much of Western political history, was considered radical, the practice of democracy. That Buckley would hold such a view should not surprise anyone familiar with his expressed disdain for the black street freedom struggle and women's liberation. But it might surprise some of you that Buckley's perspective is one that predates 1960s neoconservatism, and indeed, the very experiment in democracy known as the United States. Now comes the kicker. There is enough evidence to suggest that per Buckley's perspective on the relationship between the practice of freedom, or what Arendt would refer to as democracy, and inequality is not a conservative idea at all, but one that comes from, in a circuitous way, from the very first experiment in Western democracy, at least the experiment attributed to a genealogy of Western democracy. The implications, as I will express and su suggest to you today, is the following. If such an idea can actually be traced to democratic origins and practices, maybe the practice of democracy is not as radical as many, both past and present, once thought. This talk in the book from which it is excerpted is based on a premise that the practice of democracy, and not its idealized version, is a contributing factor to various forms of political and economic inequality in the contemporary world. The seemingly straightforward genealogy that reduces democracy to an ideal type with only its philosophical and political scaffolding ignores how coercion, empire, and forced labor have been deeply intertwined with de democracies from Greek city-states to contemporary societies. Further examination is required, then, for the ideals and proclamations about democracy, citizenship, and the polis, but also look at the exclusions that made the practice of democracy possible. Hopefully, this distinction will enable the audience to distinguish democracy as a philosophical content, concept, even ideology, from a set of practices with a specific set of actors, institutions, and motivating logics. Rather than associate democracy with a set of assumptions that are more hagiography than actual history, I'll focus on the dynamic relationships between subjects who have occupied the same territory and space of their democratic counterparts, while not participating in the virtual political community of citizens. Part of the reason why I'm approaching this topic in this manner, from the vantage point of exclusion, is because present-day economists, political scientists, and sociologists have concluded that there's more economic inequality now than at any other point in human history. Most analyses of economic inequality point to the flatlined earning power of many working people throughout the world juxtaposed against the profits made by corporations, industries, and high-earning individuals, while neglecting democracy's role in the development of institutions and regimes attached to immigration, racial hierarchy, and citizenship to render partial or non-citizens unequal access in the sphere, to the sphere of politics and in the economic sphere. In classical Athens, as well as in modern democratic polities, Various groups of people were excluded from partic political participation through law, normative reprobation, and when necessary, coercion. The legal, juridical, and institutional empowerment of citizens has been and is 
dynamically related to limiting second class citizens or prohibiting non-citizens from access to citizenship. In classical Athens, no less than in contemporary nation states founded upon de democratic principles, democratic institutions and practices have coexisted with anti-democratic ones. Now to give you some context, after the Persian Wars of fifth century BC, Athenian lawmakers decided to restrict citizenship to those who could prove that they were descendants of Athenians, Athens' first citizens, who allegedly sprang from the soil. These descendants had to be male, thereby excluding women who had previously held citizenship. The law's intent was to prohibit foreigners from obtaining citizenship and enslaving Athenian male citizens who had somehow become indebted to them. Free them then, in the Athenian case, was inextricably linked to the institution of slavery. As noted by the German political theorist Anna Arendt, Athenian freedom was based on what she called, quote, pre-political liberation, a precondition under which man, her words, could not be subject as a slave to someone else's domination or as a worker to the necess necessity of earning his daily bread, end quote. Part of my, attention, my, my contention here is that what uh, this new citizenship regime produced a political concept of autochthony designed to naturalize and restrict membership in the Athenian polity, which became a prototypical form of differentiation intended to rationalize limitations upon formable membership in the political community. It's important to note and qualify here that neither indigenous people nor the first known inhabitants of a territory are necessarily the first members of a polity. This was true for Athens as much as it was for the birth of French, British, US, and many New World democratic republics. Autochthony as a political mythology served to naturalize citizenship, making it inaccessible to those who could not prove that they descended from Athenian soil. Additionally, since citizenship descent became patrilineal, a woman, even one descended from autochthonous parents, could not become a citizen. Thus, a law designed to exclude male foreigners from acquiring and deploying citizenship consequently excluded ex Athenian-born women who were actually, rather than figuratively, born in Athens. In this sense, the autochthonous criteria for political membership also served as a form of immigration policy that excluded the majority of non-Athenian citizens from citizenship after 451 BC. Right? And here we have, we think about it in terms of keywords, links between autochthony, gender, polity, and discrimination. Athenian elites were faced with a series of questions with political import that resonated in the contemporary world. In moments of perceived or actual crisis, the prospect of war, immigrants flooding the border, how should democratic polities respond to the prospect of expanding or contracting the pool of potential citizens? What exclusionary or inclusionary practices will democracies implement to enlarge or reduce members of its polities? Moments of geopolitical crisis, such as that experienced by the Greeks during the Greco-Persian Wars, or the era of the Red Scare in the United States, or a contemporary debate in Germany, the US, and the EU more generally over migration, reveal popular and governmental anxieties about being overrun by certain, not all, foreigners. And these selective racialized and ethnicized citizenship re regimes, where citizenship becomes associated with particular types of people, particular types of bodies and not the actual exercise of citizenship rights, duties, and responsibilities. Such democracies have deployed what I've characterized in my book as ethno-national and racial regimes designed to maintain distance and distinction between members of the polity and members of society. Upon close exa examination, traces of the Athenian practice of combining ethnos, naturalized political membership, with democracy a set of institutions and practices can be found in the laws of contemporary prominent democratic polities. In these polities, racial and ethno-national hierarchy provided the rationalization for the institutionalization of political inequality based on the premise that racially and ethno-nationally divergent groups could not share the same state. And I'll unpack some of these assumptions uh, in my examples. So what I'm suggesting here is that racial and ethno-national regimes became the modern iteration of autochthony in both modern and contemporary politics. Instead of an origin myth, 
in which citizens were required to spring from the earth. Many New World nation states devised, devised citizenship criteria to simultaneously incorporate and delimit citizens based on what Charles Merriam called indices of difference. Racial and national identification, along with gender, literacy, and property requirements, constituted either pathways or barriers to citizenship, depending upon the populations in question and the nation states in which they lived. Origins of myths of another kind, however, steeped in ideology of nationalism, religion, and scientific racism, provided the ideological threads for foundational justifications for political institution exclusion and ultimately political inequality. So I'm going to highlight three, three points in this talk that will underscore the ongoing dynamics of inequality, dynamics that are relevant for our understanding of how democratic policies introduce inequalities within the societies that house them. Point one, most if not all democracies beginning with the first have operated within an ethnos, a complex of laws, customs, norms, and when necessary, coercive and exclusionary practices designed to privilege certain populations and not others. This leads to point number two, manifesting many contemporary xenophobic and white supremacist ideologies and organizations. The ethos, the ethnos of democracy presupposes homogeneity, the ideal society, one less prone to political misfortune and mishap is one where its governmental leadership always and continuously resembles the governed. Resemblance in these instances are usually premised upon ethno-national, religious, and purportedly racial coherence. At its extremes, we find this quest for homogeneity evidence in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017, South Carolina in 2017, Norway in 2016, and most recently in New Zealand in 2019. Evidence an express desire for an ethno state or region of pure white people. Third, the tension between freedom and servitude, inclusion and ex uh, exclusion, articulated in dynamic interactions between democracy's pa participants and its excluded, have resulted in social and political movements for equality that have expanded the boundaries of democratic policies through the incorporation of various people who would not otherwise be part of the citizen state pact. In many instances, those who are transformed from excluded to included included women for both majority and minority groups, uh, ethno-national, religious, and so-called racial groups. And these movements for equal rights were often followed by repressive measures, both popular and state-based, directed towards those advocating for re equal rights. It is worth repeating that democratic states, democratic states, like all states, have their inclusionary and exclusionary dimensions. Thus, we arrive at the following question. Which barriers to political and civic membership are considered tolerable, and which ones aren't? Barriers to certain forms of civic membership, such as same-sex marriage, gays in the military, reproductive and transgender rights, voting rights for racialized, racialized and minoritized populations, and immigrant and migrant rights are examples of these institutionalized barriers to democracy or polity. As I will outline below, through contemporary as well as historical examples, most taken from France and Britain, with a few from the United States. One of the few continuities between the practice of democracy in classical Athens and modern politics is that justifications of exclusion have relied on some mythical account of the first people within a polity, not to be confused with the first people on a particular territory. Edward Augustus Freeman, one of the founding members of the History of the Department of Oxford, was a visiting scholar at Johns Hopkins and worked with uh, Herbert Baxter Adams, who was another uh, advocate of the sort of Teutonic belief and the belief in Euro-Aryan mastery of politics, that, they, that the Germans were the state makers uh, par, par excellence. There was a great review by an Edward Sabbath, uh, I think in the 20s, uh, writing about this view in which he caricatures the view by saying that you know, it is this image of, of Germans coming out of the forest with state-making capacities. Right? Right? So Edward Gustus Freeman, one of the founding members of the History Department of Oxford, and a long forgotten but no less central figure in the development of comparative politics, made the link between the race category and political community in the United States in order to make a broader cross-spatial claim that, quote, the United States, and in their measure, 
other parts of the American continent islands have to grapple with a problem such as no other people have ever had to grapple with before. Other communities from the beginning of political society have either been avowedly or practically founded on distinctions of race. So in this sense, we can contrast it with de Tocqueville's suggestion that in some ways the unprecedented experiment the United States uh, embarked on was an experiment in democracy. Freeman is suggesting that what's real, the real experiment was the idea that people from different groups of so-called racists could live in, in the same political uh, community. And um, anyone who's familiar with him knows that he was an equal opportunity bigot. He had um, many hilarious comments, if you understand the tragic comic nature of, of uh, racial epithets. Um, and he, there were not too many people in the world other than his notion of what Euro-Aryans were. Um, that he, in fact, liked. But he had a big influence uh, on a number of thinkers, uh, most importantly, uh, the 28th President of the United States, Woodrow Wilson. Right? So Freeman is one of the central protagonists of my book because he developed the first systematic account, what he referred to as a scientific method, to compare and contrast political institutions in order to prove what he termed Euro-Aryans, who were the state makers par excellence, and thus the people on the planet most suited to create a modern politics with a demographic symmetry between those governing and those governed. So common to the 19th and mid 20th century discussions about comparative politics was a core preoccupation. How could distinct peoples with varying capacities for self-governance participate in the same polity? A cursory examination of political events in the second decade of the 21st century revealed to the interested observer that this question is a recurrent one on the minds of states and non-state actors throughout the West and other parts of the world. This section I call the social question. In the Americas, including the United States and France, elites wishing to throw, overthrow colonial rule in the 18th century uh, sought an equilibrium between their new societies based on the one hand upon slave and other forms of coarse labor, and on the other hand, fledgling democracies and republics they proclaimed on the other. This tension would appear in the majority of emergent nation states in the Americas, which held on to slavery as the dominant mode of production for several generations after their formal declarations and achievements of national independence. In France, the issue of slavery split the Jacobin bourgeoisie and represented the limits of their, the horizons of their revolution, while in the United States, the lack of resolution of slavery split the North and South in the years after independence leading ultimately to the Civil War. Two notable foreign to the U.S. and France commentators, C.L.R. James and Hannah Arendt, both provided insightful commentary on the U.S., French, and Haitian revolutions, with Arendt extending her analysis to encompass ancient Greece and what came to be known as a social question in the 18th century after the aftermath of the U.S. and French revolutions. Arendt highlights how, just as in ancient Greece, the architects of the political revolutions of France and the United States largely overlooked the social question. Commenting on the plight of black sl slaves after the U.S. gained independence from Britain, she rhetorically wonders, quote, whether the goodness of the poor white man's country did not dis depend to a considerable degree upon black labor and black misery, ellipsis. The institution of slavery carries an obscurity even blacker than the obscurity of poverty. The slave, not the poor man, was wholly overlooked. Right? These are Rent's words. And without irony here, um, uh, blacker misery and all those sorts of things, um, the practice of freedom then, even for poor whites, was premised upon the enslavement of blacks and on the prohibitions against indigenous participation in U.S. policy. Now, some of this is already covered in a magisterial book by Edmund Mor Morgan, American Slavery and American Freedom. Comparing the U.S. and French revolutions, Arendt concludes that slavery was no more part of the social question for Europeans than it was for Americans, so that the social question, whether generally absent or only hidden in darkness, was non-existent for all practical purposes. Right? Invariably, continuing, these revolutions spelled freedom only for the few and was hardly felt by the many who remained loaded down by misery. Right? Similarly, in his account of the Haitian Revolution, C.L.R. James wrote that slavery served to remind the Jacobins and their progressive and missionary allies of the colonial question. 
the specter of the colony and their deliberations regarding public and freedoms. Yet with the exception of an organization devoted to the abolition of slavery, the Friends of the Negro, quote, James proclaims, everybody conspired to forget the slaves. Referring to debates in a French assembly, at the moment when conflicts between left and right prompted a thermidor reaction and the brutal countermeasures to follow, James concluded that the colonial question again and again split the bourgeoisie, made it ashamed of itself, destroyed its morale, and weakened its capacity to deal with the great problems which faced it. One participant in these discussions in France during the period of the terror succinctly captured the problems not only of France, but democracies more generally that clung to the institution of slavery at the same time that they were constructing Republican democratic institutions. And that's a long quote here, but I think it's worth uh, noting. Without speaking here of the danger and folly of slavery in democratic states, I could cite the history of all the peoples who have had slaves and depict the torments of the government, whether it tries to keep them in a yoke that often quakes with their struggles and tries to diminish their too great population, or whether it tries to restrain the cruelty of the masters. I could cite the laws that rapidly succeed one another, the regulations that follow upon regulation. So what he's saying in some sense, to maintain the inequality of slavery requires bureaucracy, right, and drives the expansion of the state apparatus. This passage, taken from his speech celebrating the abolition of slavery just two months earlier, was written by Pierre Gaspard Chaumet, a leading journalist and member of the Paris city government during the revolution between 1790 until his date with the guillotine during the terror in April 1794. His comment, directed at pro-slavery French Republicans, leads us back in time to earlier iterations of democracy that were tangled with, entangled with the practice of slavery. But Chaumet's comments also encompass the nation states following France the United States that also conjoined the practice of slavery with democratic practices. Right? Quote, the regulations that follow upon regulations are the legal apparatuses required to continually repress and coerce subordinated enslaved populations. And they serve as a reminder that there are no human beings on this earth who willingly and immediately accept enslavement without a fight. French Republicanism, Republicanism like the majority of Republican ideologies in Latin America, emphasized citizenship and therefore public and civic identification over all other forms of identification. Nation then was presumed to trump religious ethnic, gender, and other forms of collective identification. And yet, in practical terms, distinctions among populations had implicit and explicit legal implications in everyday life. France, known throughout Europe to accept and even encourage waves of European immigration in the 19th and early 20th centuries, imposed stricter immigration controls and popular, scru and popular scrutiny of non-white immigration into France. Like Germany, Britain, and Belgium in the post-World War II years, the French government encouraged and subsidized migra migration from its colonies and departments to offset dwindling labor pools. And this is a point often forgotten by the xenophobic anti-immigration advocates in the EU currently. Right? And part of this, in some sense, was uh, addressed uh, by uh, Frantz Fanon in the Al Algerian, on the Algerian Revolution, in which he stated, the he lays bare the tensions between an imperial nation state masquerading as a democratic republic, and which utilizes law to manage the tension between democratic and anti-democratic public spheres. This is his quote. Algeria's European Democrats, in the framework of the Algerian war, could not as a whole act like their homologue living in France. Democracy in France traditionally lives in broad daylight. In Algeria, democracy is tantamount to treason. Under the conditions of colonialism set forth by the French government, the Algerian nation state was inconceivable. For the indigenous Algerians, as well as Europeans who supported the revolution, French rep repression of nationalist aspirations made the practice of democracy impossible. A European could speak her or his mind in France, but not in Algeria. Fanon captures one of the many contradictions inherent in the colonial metropolitan relationship. The French presiding over liberal democratic republic prohi prohibits freedom and voluntary association among a population in a site that's been seized by force. 
With force came pacification and the dictation of the conditions of labor and employment, educational, legal, and juridical codes, uh, immigration, and the movement for, support, uh, and movement for the subordinated population. Right, and I, call, I could go on, but I'll cut some of this example here. I'll turn to the U.S. The con conjuncture of racial regimes and immigration policy in the U.S. helps demonstrate how ethnic and racial categorizations are dynamically related and ultimately determined in and through politics. Some populations who are now classified as white or prototypically American were once classified as ethno-national, even racial groups, whose claims on citizenship were suspect. Governmental rationalizations for the exclusion of white ethnic populations usually contain some ethnized or racialized justification in addition to class, regional, and other factors. And here are two examples of thinking about the, uh, the depiction and exclusion against the Irish and the Italians, right? uh, certainly based on the 1920 census. Uh, additionally, state and federal laws concerning slavery and black insurrection directly influenced the development of national immigration policy, restrictions on the internal movement of black peoples within the United States, and restrictions upon the travel and movement of black citizens or subjects in the United States to other polities. Right? One example from the, another example from the U.S. is the McCann-Walter Acts of 1952. While often viewed by scholars of U.S. immigration policy as a significant shift from race-based immigration policy to quotas based upon national origin, the McCarrick and Walter Acts, in some important respects, continue to maintain the formal as well as tacit parameters of racial and ideolog ideological conformity of previous, previous immigration laws. On the one hand, it, it erased the racial restrictions of the 1790 Freeborn White Persons Edict, it nonetheless contains significantly higher entry quotas for Northern European immigrants. And while maintaining racial restrictions for Asian immigrants, specifically Japanese, Koreans, and Pacific Islanders. While no explicit restriction of other non-white immigrants was in the 1952 Act, quota restrictions of 100 people per year were levied upon entrance from the British West Indies, Trinidad, Jamaica, and the Virgin Islands. As islands of the British Commonwealth, proponents of this portion of the bill argued its quota restric restrictions were components of Britain's national quota. The author of the bill argued that black immigrants from Haiti and the Dominican Republic were under no such restrictions since they were sovereign nations and not colonies. Thus, it argued, the bill did not have a racially discriminatory basis. Those opposed to the act, however, noted that no other immigration population in the Western Hemisphere had similar uh, quota restrictions. Right? For an example, in a discussion of an amendment passed in, uh, on April 23rd to give nations with a quota of under 7,000 the unused portions of, from nations with greater quota allotments, one uh, representative uh, of Wood of Iowa, of Idaho, st stated that while he was not a follower of Hitler, the idea of racial superiority had some validity. Metaphorically referring to the idea of Aryan racial supremacy, Wood stated, quote, we cannot tie a stone around its neck and dump it into the Atlantic just because it worked to the contrary in Germany. I believe that possibly, possibly statistics would show that the West European races have made the best citizens in America and are more easily made into Americans. With the unfounded assertion that possibly statistics would prove him right, Wood's preference for maintaining lower quotas for non-white immigrants had blatant echoes of Herrenvoke notions of national unity. Sound familiar? Contemporary. On the eve of the white nationalist demonstration and counter protests in Charlottesville, Virginia, on August 14, 2017, 17, right-wing nationalists, fascists, and neo-Nazi sympathizers gathered in front of several monuments to the Confederate Confederacy that had been targeted for demolition. Their chilling, well-rehearsed chant will be familiar to those who viewed the video footage or who were there, compiled by the reporter embedded in a crowd of mostly, though not exclusively male, white nationalists who marched through the streets with torches and shouted in unison, ground in soil, we will not be replaced, Jews will not replace us. In contra, in a country with a remarkable lack of historical memory, the words and deeds of white nationalist protesters that evening were often interpreted by, interpreted by everyday citizens, pundits, and politicians alike as unprecedented expressions of pure evil. 
Yeah, anyone with any historical knowledge of the U.S. Civil Rights Movement or the fascist and anti-fascist mobilization of World War II will recognize the invocations of whiteness, anti-Semitism, and Nazism in Charlottesville as a composite echo of previous, previous periods in U.S. and Western histories. The invocation of a political community in, in search of a following, drenched in racist ideology. One of the spokespeople who received the most attention for several days after the events in Charlottesville revealed to an interviewer his dream of an ethnostate, presumably a nation state in which the governed and the government were racially unified. This particular racist vision has a civic imaginary that bears traces of the vision of Edward Augustus Freeman and Woodrow Wilson, two, several, two of several advocates of democracy, political modernity, and racial hierarchy conjoined. Yet the invocations of the white racists in Charlottesville also can contain elements of an older, ancient series of association, which, as we have discovered, can be traced back to classical Athens of the 5th century BCE, of blood and soil. In, in 2017, these white nationalists became their inheritance, not only the soil of the United States, but the polity as well, notwithstanding the fact that Jews, blacks, Latinos, and other groups prohibited from sharing their ethnostate could also make similar claims to the same blood and soil of the United States. The very language of replacement suggested that the hope for a polity of white nationalists was one in which citizens were born, not made. No amount of religious conversion or socialization could compensate for the inherent limitations of the excluded groups. Thus, the criteria for a white nationalist civic imaginary also included a warning of the dangers of miscegenation between white women and non-Aryan men, with a clearly articulated desire protect, to protect their women from the clutches of Jews and blacks. In the case of, as in the case of classical Athens, this particular articulation of autochthony reveals male anxieties over women's sovereignty over their own bodies, the corporal sovereignty and autonomy of women in relation to men, and ultimately, patriarchy, paternity, and citizenship. There are limits, obviously, in drawing parallels between 2007 events, 17 events, and classical Athens, between the exhortations of fascists and neo-fascists, with the intellectuals, playwrights, and citizens of Athens regarding the most preferable form of political life. But human beings come into existence through procreation. People become citizens through politics, not nature and certainly not the soil. Second, the linkage of autochthony blood and soil with citizenship, whether in Athens, Nazi Germany, or the contemporary United States, ultimately entails a disenfranchisement of an extant group of citizens and a categorical exclusion of people who would otherwise be eligible for citizenship. The mythos of what I call the new autochthonists, like their predecessors in 1920s and 1940s, Germany, Italy, Ar Argentina, Brazil, the United States, and elsewhere, is to make the racial imaginary coterminous with the civic imaginary. The central problem these acted upon desires would require is removal, marginalization, eradication of those excluded from participation in the polity. And that would include the exclusion and disenfranchisement of the populations I mentioned earlier, but also in a parallel with uh, Nazi Germany. And uh, Mark Mazauer's book, The Dark Continent, Europe's 20th Century, I think, captures much of this. Well, uh, well, about uh, Hitler's uh, overall desires to basically remap and redesign not only Europe, but what we now know as a former Soviet Union, um, where you'd have uh, symmetry between uh, uh, governed and governed along racial lines. Yeah. Such a project and projects like these would entail significant costs, political, social, moral, psychological, ethnical, to white nationalists and opponents alike in the effort to remake U.S. society and polity. In 2017, 2018, and now 2019, the world has witnessed the lengths some white nationalist groups will go to publicize, if not implement, their vision of political community. The assumption of common origins or membership in a pre-political community, which in turn became criteria for membership in a political community, democratic or otherwise, has been an enduring feature of world politics well into the 21st century. The lesson I would emphasize here for our contemporary moment is that population homogeneity, like the category of the, the foreigner and citizen, is a political artifact 
not something we find ready-made in the world, not something that ever existed. So much of the origin tales told by various ultranationalists and xenophobic movements in nation states rely on stories and genealogies that are themselves mythical. What we are witnessing now is a combination of ethno-nationalism, populist authoritarianism, and in some cases blatant racism. And I, I will be willing to talk in the U.S. and the Q&A why I think most of these movements aren't fascist movements, but I'd be happy to talk about this in the Q&A. Just as in previous ten iterations in history, this poisonous cocktail is little more than a quest for homogeneity, linking immigration, citizenship, and racial regimes within a more comprehensive vision of a political community. In this nostalgic yet patently ahistorical vision, civic, both societal and civic membership remains based upon some, born, some group born of the same soil or homeland or origin. When we add measures of massacres of non-white immigrants, citizen residents in Norway, New Zealand, as well as the United States, perhaps skeptics, liberal or otherwise, have long treated racism and racial hierarchy as an anomaly, a blip on the screen that recurs largely in the United States, will acknowledge what many scholars, activists, and everyday folk have been declaring for well over a century. White supremacy and white nationalism are multi-site, multi-regional, and multinational phenomena not link, li limited to any particular country. Right. How much more time I have, Neil? You need me to speed it up? Yeah, you know. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So let me, let me, um, let me, okay, so let me uh, wrap this up um, before you bring out the rope. Um, disagreements within Europe and the United States regarding who is and who can be a European or a citizen of the United States can be boiled down to the following question. By what criteria shall we allow some people and not others to settle into a society? In answering this question, policymakers and the average citizen may do well to consider the possibility that democracy itself, as historically and politically practiced, not as idealized forms, may be part of the problem, not necessarily the solution to intolerance and inequality in the contemporary world. And I'll skip over some of the um, conclusion here. Okay. Could it be, this is, this is the conclude, cl wrapping up now, could it be that even under the most practical conditions for the elaboration of democratic and republican ideals, a subordinated laboring mo majority population with limited or non-existent political rights is necessary for the function of democracy for the few? And if so, by what criterion of political judgment would citizens be determined? Would birth, origins, or responsibilities determine or strongly impact the definition of the citizen. It's important to remember the following about democracy, whether in classical Athens or in the present day. It was not designed to, inc to incorporate all inhabitants in the territory where democracy was practiced, but only in the relation between citizens and government, what we now refer to as a state. Democratic deliber deliberation, judgment, and action does not guarantee that democratic outcomes await those who are the object of deliberation. Slavery is the institution that underscores this seeming paradox in the following manner. If a government, along with many of its citizens, approved the enslavement of a population in order to generate sustenance, profit for themselves, is this a signal of democracy in action or coercion in the name of democracy or both? No? Perhaps now William F. Buckley's assertion about the necessary relationship between freedom and inequality might not seem so odd once we recognize that they emerge from an accurate interpretation of the practice of democracy, which is ultimately democracy's problem and our problem, not his. As discomforting as it will surely be to some, an exploration of the tension between freedom and inequality provides one way to trace the contours and limits of democracy in the contemporary world. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Questions, comments? Actually, to go back, um, I mean, I wanted to hear how you, why you thought the eth ethno-nationalism mm -hmm. now is not fascist, how you make that distinction. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 
Um, my interpretation of the fascism are um, influenced by, by two, 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 two authors, uh, Michael Mann and Robert Paxson. And Robert Paxson makes distinctions between fascist movements, fascist movements, and fascist regimes. And one of the things that he identified, and in many ways, the fascist, the, the fascist regimes, fascist movements far outnumber fascist regimes, right? And in his sort of, he doesn't want to come up with a, a generic uh, definition, but one of the things that he, but also scholars, particularly of Nazism, um, but also of Italian fascism, have emphasized the development of parallel institutions, right? Um, the identification of, uh, of another, an internal enemy, right, that requires uh, some form of liquidation or deportation, right? Um, and so one of the things, that's part of the reason why I asked the question to uh, uh, Keisha earlier today, one of the things that I've been preoccupied is understanding um, the interrelationship between fascism and racial rule, right? And so much of the modalities of racial rule ex experienced and articulated both in colonial context, but also within the, within the sort of belly of democratic polities, um, has if what you would call sort of fascist components. So Paxton argues that, in fact, probably the first instance of, um, of, of fascism in the world may be the Ku Klux Klan at, during, during and after Reconstruction, right? Because they develop uh, they develop forms of exactly, exactly, exactly. I've been trying to think through. I'd like to hear you think about what you think follows from our saying. Yes, democracy is part of the problem. So yes, constitutively, mm -hmm. it's ethno-nationalist. Mm -hmm. And yes, therefore, those of us who are anti-subordination and anti-racist right. have a problem. Right. So how do you name the struggle against that problem if constitutively democracy is complicit in it, right? So right. is there, is there a, right. a, a no. non-subordinating, multiracial, solidaristic conception of democracy lurking in the background of your sure. analysis that you haven't articulated, or sure. do we need, you know, or are we, are, are we looking at a post-democratic radical politics? Mm, that's a great question. So um, let me think about this for just a millisecond. Um, I'd probably say some combination of both, but leaning towards the latter, right? I mean, I think that there are ways in which if as in the case of the Haitian Revolution, the black freedom struggles in the United States, uh, uh, from the women's suffragist movement to second and third wave feminisms, not just the United States and elsewhere. Um, you know, there's a kind of teleological argument that argues that, you know, um, these movements make claims um, about being excluded, and then through time they're gradually included, and this is a feature of democracy at work, as if this is something intrinsic to a telos of democracy. Right? And my, part, my point is that these movements don't emerge and they don't actually gain the rights that they request without social and political struggle. Right? And so I actually been, I'm teaching a course, it's called Fascism and Racism, a Love Story. Um, <laughs> and, um, well, love means never having to say you're sorry, right? 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 Um, yeah, and so, you know, it's in this court, one of the things you know, I'm, I'm actually, we're doing in a couple of weeks is bringing activists from dis different parts of the world who, who engage uh, in uh, anti-fascist struggle. And I asked them, you know, a couple of questions, and the kind of lead up is, well, well for you, what's the difference between an anti-fascist movement and an anti-racist movement, right? And the answers vary depending upon the location. So one Italian activist said, well, you know, um, I'm one of the few black people in the anti-fascist movement, um, but in the anti-racist movement, you know, I'm there with a lot of uh, Afro-Italian uh, residents and citizens and, uh, and, Im and immigrants, right? right? So, you know, each place has a different, but I think, you know, it's, I guess my part of my, I'd have to theorize more about this, but I guess part of my pet peeve, which, which, which sort of, I think, comes up is that, you know, so much of the discussions, even some at this conference, have treated democracy as if it was this sort of ideal type and that most of its, um, the threats to democracy come from exogenous factors, right? As opposed to considering the reality that if 
this, these sorts of uh, practices produce forms of inequality for some and vast inequality for other sets of people that just in political terms and existential human terms, right, um, that there's only so much, you know, human groups will, will, will put up with this without rebelling in some shape or form, right? I can give you an example. The, the Demerara Rebellion um, in 19th century uh, Guyana, just by my late great advisor, Emilio Viotti uh, da Costa, um, did a lot of uh, primary archival work um, and from newspaper accounts and correspondence where when, on, on the eve of slave rebellion, slaves were talking about that they had rights too, right? And they didn't outline what those rights were, but I think in some sense what they were sort of getting at at least it seems to me, is what, you know, what, what Philip Pettit would refer to as non-arbitrary domination, right? right? And that, you know, that has different elements, but I think it also suggests that you know, we should look to other models right? and other ways of building communi political community with, uh, between, between people. I don't know if that answered the question, but I tried my best. No, sure. Uh, I wouldn't otherwise, but uh, <laughs> thank you very much. That was, you know, very provocative and uh, chastening and um, sobering. And um, you know, it's a it's a, a moment when you know theory, political theory the ideal, in your term, kind of checks in with reality and with history. Mm -hmm. So um, there's, a, you know, there's a, there's a kind of a, a question for me about, you know, w what history is in the life of the mind today, okay? Mm -hmm. So I think that the when we look at the historical record about just about anything, mm -hmm. and a democracy certainly is one, mm -hmm. um, you know, we won't find much that we affirm. I mean, there, there are moments, mm -hmm. but the, you know, it's, uh, you know, whether you're, you take a kind of a Hobbesian view or whatever, however you look at it, it, it seems to be historically um, a, a story of oppression, more often than not, triumphing. Now, in relation to that, um, what are the possibilities f for the ideal, you know, for theory? Um, so we might look at um, historical movements, whether it be feminism, or the long civil rights movement, or a abolitionism, or um, you know the revolution on behalf of quote unquote the rights of man, but which of course turned out not to be that. There, there's always a kind of an invocation of the ideal there. So it's it's kind of I'm what I'm trying to a question I'm trying to ask is um, given the history that you. Uh, so compellingly summarized, is there still any place uh, for you um, in your thinking, you know, for quote unquote the ideal? This is kind of a different way of asking the first question in a way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, so, so I think I've gotten asked this question by several liberal theorists. Um, who I respect both their work and mine, even I have profound um, disagreements with. And I think what I would say first is that one of the things that makes, I think, democracy rhetorically so paradoxical is that it provides within itself the language for its own re resistance to it, right, in ways that notions of the theocracy, divine right, right, or feudal orders don't really provide, right? Um, and how that language gets Right, articulated, um, is also premised on certain appeals and in some cases enlightenment-based understandings that one could appeal to one's 
uh, repressor, right, um, and move or transform that re repressor. But then what happens? But then how does how does one account for coercion in that in, in that equation, right? And it seems to me that many of these discussions, you know, coercion gets evacuated. And so for me, historically, it becomes a way to kind of re rearrange the chairs on a particular historical terrain. So I'd give you a couple of examples. Um, the double V campaign in the 1930s and 40s in the United States, right, where, where uh, black servicemen and women, uh, black civil rights activists, you know, blacks on the, on, the, uh, on the hard left, right, was suggesting to stop racism abroad, right, but also stop Jim Crow, right, at home. Also because they saw the parallels and the similarities, right? So democracy, particularly in its U.S. version, wasn't necessarily a safe haven for them, right? James and Padmore, right, in, in London, uh, in response to the Italian invasion of, of Ethiopia, and then subsequently in discussion um, why Negroes should oppose, oppose the war, right, World War II. So that's, look, you know, this allied access stuff, really, you know, that's really not part of our political continuum, right? Whether, whoever wins, comes out of this war victorious, we're still going to be owned by it. Right, so one side or another. So what does what does what does this mean for us? Right, or George Lamming, his first visit to um, when he first goes to uh, England, the great Barbadian novelist, and he goes to a party, and there's a British and a French uh, man talking. They see him, and they say, "Well, who do you belong to, them or us?" Right. So there's this proprietary, right? This proprietary thing, right? And so um, unless we can think about some sort of neutral. Um, democracy, one that doesn't sort of respect or understand difference. But in some sense, I think the, the moment we're in now, not just the United States, but other places, is, um, and I guess George and I were talking about this before, and I guess it, in this sense, I, I'm, I have limits on, personal limits on free speech a advocacy, only because of the following reason. At one point, do, does one decide, or government decide, or people decide that, you know, xenophobic, nationalist, you know, uh, homophobic ideas with the intent not only to do little figurative harm, but also little harm, become not just opinions, but threats to the very notion of republic, right? And then what does, what does the state do in response to those kinds of threats? And if you go back to, you know, Weimar Republic, right, this was an issue, um, you know, France before the occupation, this was an, an issue, right, that, that liberal states have difficulty in forging and expanding, diffusing notions of community, right? And that's one of the things that's an attraction to white people who feel disenfranchised, right? That they're besieged, that they're overtaken, that the society they lived in or their parents lived in, they don't, they don't, they don't recognize it anymore. It's not recognized. They don't, they're not recognized as, as uh, equals or that they're aggrieved in some kind of way. So I think all these things are part of the impasse moment that we are that that we're, that we're in now. Right? And so the idea or the recognition that, I mean, I mean, there's so many different ways. I mean, you think about the differences in, um, what is it, Pittsburgh, um, you know, the, not the, the Jewish Community Center, not the, yeah. one, right? Where, you know, one of the ironies of the United States as an already plural society, right? The gunman goes in, he shoots up and kills all these people, and most of them are not Jews, right? They're black people, they're Indian people, all these people who are using these communities places, right, that become, you know, part of a kind of civic culture, right, right? So again, this idea somehow that there's this place that one could go to and find exclusively Jews, right, and then, you know, by getting rid of them, you know, this would, this is Dylan Roos land, right, to, 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 to generate a race war, right, right, or, you know, a range of different, but they share the same kind of fantasy. At what point does this fantasy, when acted upon, become a threat, right, to the very policy that, has been idealized for so long. So, I, I asked one already. I think probably because of uh, time, uh, we'll maybe close out the formal keynote. We can have the conversation after. So join me in thanking uh, Michael. Hanks.